Man, super excited to be with you guys this morning. Um, I just want to talk to you this morning as you see the screen behind me, and I titled today's lesson Commitment Issues. And I think that if we will really surrender our hearts to God and let Him speak to us this morning, He will speak something specifically to you that will help you rekindle your commitments that you've made. Okay? Minister Glover was going through her, her, I don't know if there were notes, but whatever she was sharing this morning, I was like, sister, you're going to preach the whole message. Slow down. Lord, save me a little bit, please. And then I said, Lord, thank you so much, because if they're hearing it now and they hear it again in a few minutes, maybe just maybe they will get it. A few years ago, I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I didn't like what I saw. And some of y'all are laughing already. <laughs> that is not the part for you to laugh at. <laughs> I didn't like what I saw. I pulled out the scale and I placed it on the floor and I stepped on the scale. I didn't like what I saw. So I moved the scale up a little bit more just in case the floor was uneven right there. And I got on the scale again and it said the same thing. It said 240 pounds. And I was like, that can't be right. I had never been that heavy my whole life. And when I looked at those numbers, I said to myself, I committed myself right then. This can never happen to me. I'm done. That's what I said. I'm, do I'm done eating forever. I'm never eating again. <laughs> so I started my weight loss journey. I began eating a plant-based diet. I was committed to seeing it through. Committed. It took me a minute to find my groove because I didn't like what I was eating. I couldn't stand eating salad all the time. I had to find something else, but it had to be plant-based because I was staying away from meat and dairy and sugar and oil. And all I was eating was vegetables and fruit and uh, I'm sick of this. And then one day it hit, I found a groove to where when I ate, I was okay with what I was eating. I didn't feel like I was punishing myself. But I didn't get on the scale because I just didn't feel like I was seeing any results. I'm like, I'm not getting on the scale and getting discouraged. So I let myself go a few weeks following the plan. And I'll never forget the day I decided to finally step on that scale for the first time. And I said to myself, if this thing says I've only lost five pounds, I'm gonna be highly upset. Because I couldn't see very much. So I stepped on the scale, and it said I had lost 12 pounds. I was like, cha-ching. My commitment was refreshed. I was hype at that moment. I was like, okay, okay, 12 pounds in like two and a half weeks. We got this. Let's get it. Did you know that you could actually support the YouTube channel and podcast? That's right. If you have a desire to be a blessing to the show, there's many different ways you can do it. We have Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, and you can use the website to make a donation. Any donation will help and every donation will be used to pour into the lives of others. So if you want to click on the description of this video, you can find all of the information you need to make a donation. God bless you. And and thank you for your support. My momentum started to build. So I said, I'm going to weigh myself every Friday, once a week, every Friday. So I got on the scale the next week and I was down some more. I started seeing my weight going in the right direction, the right direction, the right direction. In about three months, I had lost nearly 40 pounds. Three months. And then Thanksgiving hit. <laughs> and so I decided to cook with my wife a Thanksgiving meal. Now, mind you, I've been cooking all this time because my wife doesn't cook. So I would cook for me and I would cook for them. They didn't eat what I was eating. So I decided to cook the Thanksgiving meal with my wife and she cooked the ham. It was so good. I decided to cash in my commitment just for Thanksgiving, though. Just for Thanksgiving, I'm going to get back on track the day after Thanksgiving. She made a ham that was so good. 
I made some sweet potatoes. I told you I hadn't had butter or sugar in three and a half months. It was like a drug. I bit into those sweet potatoes and I'm like, God, you created this? How did I miss this before? I'm licking my fingers, I'm eating the ham. My wife even made dressing for the first time. Now, the dressing was really good or I hadn't eaten nothing in so long, anything would have been really good. No, but in all seriousness, she did a phenomenal job the first time she made dress. It was really good. And I'm like, okay, tomorrow I renew my commitment. Tomorrow has not come yet. That was, that was two Thanksgivings ago. Two Thanksgivings ago, and it has not happened yet. So I saw my weight start going in the wrong direction. But I said to myself when I got off the scale, it's okay, you're still down 35 pounds. You're still good. I got on the scale the next week. It's okay, you're still down 30 pounds. Come on, bro, you still lost 30 pounds. You gotta still be proud of yourself. 25, 20. I got on the scale this morning. You ain't have to say it like that, sister. <laughs> I got on the scale this morning and I looked at the numbers. I blinked my eyes twice and looked again. It said 239.8. Now, I know y'all may not be math scholars, but I'm sure you can round up 239.8 and figure out I'm right back to where I started from those years ago. What has happened to me? Why would I share this with you? Why would I stand up here in transparency and vulnerable in front of you and share stuff that most people like to hide? Why would I do that? Because I'm hoping that God will speak to us through today and get us all to see that a lot of us have commitment issues. We said we were committed to him, but yet we look at our life. If we really look at our lives, we will see I'm going in the wrong direction. I mean, I'm fine. You know what, brother? At least you don't do A, B, and... No. That's how I looked at the scale. At least I'm down still 30 pounds. And now I'm 30 pounds heavy. Heavier. Right. They call that weight cycling. When you lose some weight, then you gain the weight back. But most time you gain more than you lost. But the commitment was to lose weight. What if my commitment was to change my life? versus to lose the weight because when the commitment is channeled in a different direction it's going to change my thought process about the commitment once i lost the weight i was good i'm good now so what happens when you're good you go back to what you once were but if you recognize i'm never good enough and I know that's a hard thing to say. What I mean by that is I'm never satisfied. I'm always striving to get closer to the goal. I'm always striving to get closer to my God. And if that's your commitment, you're never going to reach the pinnacle, which means you're always going to be grabbing toward God. Hmm. Psalms 37 and 5. You may want to write these down just in case you don't trust me. Go back and read them when you get home. I wouldn't trust me. That's my way of saying write these down. <laughs> Psalms 37 5 says, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Commit thy way unto the Lord. I looked up the word commitment because I wanted to know what this word means. And I opened up the Merriam Webster's Dictionary and this is what Webster says commitment is it's an agreement or pledge to do something in the future. It's an agreement or a pledge to do something in the future. Then I found another definition for commitment that wasn't a dictionary definition, but I loved it. Listen to this. I love this. It says commitment is the ability to stick with something long after the initial excitement is gone. I'm going to say it again in case you missed it. Commitment 
is the ability to stick with something long after the initial excitement is gone. There's a song that we used to sing that says, when the song is over, when the music stops, do you know Jesus? Does he live in your heart? Y'all know that song? When the song is over, see, we hype when the song is over. Ooh, they, ooh, they singing that song. We feeling it. When the music stops, when we're at home on Thursday, when the pastor's done preaching and hooping, and I, I mean, I was sweating as hard as he was. When it's a Thursday and I'm home alone and I can't hear him preach no more. The music has stopped. The song is over. Where's my commitment then? Where's my commitment then? I'll never forget years ago, I think I was married about five years at this time. I've been married 15 years. Man, my wife put up for me for 15 years. 15 years this month. Can y'all believe? Most of y'all were there that day. You ain't got to clap. She about ready to get rid of me. So 15 years, on year five, I went to my old school to return some equipment I borrowed. And all the ladies in the Officer, hey, Coach Cody, how you doing? I'm like, hey, how y'all doing? How's everything? Everything's good. How's your wife? I said, my wife is good. She's wonderful. I'm so blessed. I said a couple other words like that. And this old man behind me heard me. And he goes, young man, how long have you been married? He said it with this, this something in his voice. I said, sir, I've been married about five years. <laughs> you still in the newlywed phase. Talk to me when you get to 25. I said, sir, I'm going to be honest with you. My goal is to make sure I'm still in the newlywed phase at year 25. That's my goal. All the ladies were like, ah. And he looked at me like, Negro, please. <laughs> Listen to this quote. I thought it was beautiful. I don't know who said it because it said anonymous beside the quote. It says, commitment in the face of conflict produces character. Commitment in the face of conflict produces character. But when I read that, God made me flip the words around and this is what I read. Character in the face of conflict reveals our commitments. What you're truly committed to is going to impact and direct every aspect of your life. We've all made commitments to Christ. Every one of you in this room, I have been here when most of you came down. We've made those commitments, but here's the question. Are we keeping those commitments? Why is it that this is the one commitment that is so easy to compromise? We stick to our diet. But we don't stick to our belief system. We stick to our job, but we don't stick close with Christ. Why is it that this is the one area where it's so easy for me to kind of give a half-hearted commitment? So it's my prayer that after you listen today, that God will help you and help me deal with our commitment issues. That we renew our commitment to him. And then we start be living our very, very best life. Proverbs 16 and 3, write this down. I'm going to read it to you in two different translations. I'm going to read the King James, then I'm going to read the New Living Translation because I love the way it reads. Proverbs 16 and 3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. There's that word again, commit. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Now here's the New Living Translation. Commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. Did y'all get that? Commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. What if, now this is a what if, what if every action Every action we did, we consulted God, we considered God, and we committed it as unto God. What if every action we did those things? According to this verse here, this is Solomon, the wisest man other than Jesus. 
He says that if you will do this, if you'll commit your actions to the Lord, you will succeed. You will have success in your life if all you do is say, you know what, Lord, how do you want me to handle this? Lord, which direction should I go? Lord, how should I best tackle this situation? Slow down, consult him. Slow down, consider him. How will, if I do this, how will it impact my witness? How will it impact my connection to Christ? You know what? That's going to interfere with something. I'm going to stay away from that. You know what? That's going to lead me closer to Christ. That's what I choose to do. There is a CEO of a company called The Resume Store. His name is Arnie Scher. And the only reason I share that with you is because if he's the CEO of the resume store, that means he's in the business of helping people get their resumes tight so they can get a J-O-B, which means he knows what they look for on a J-O-B. And most people on a J-O-B wants people who are committed. Listen to the quote that I found that he said. He says, there is but one degree of commitment total. So you're either totally committed or you're uncommitted. There is no kind of committed. I'm either committed or I'm not committed. Pastor Coleman said it this way years ago. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant. There's no kind of pregnant. Let me let me hide back here before I say the pregnant again. Y'all looking at my gut, (laughs) you know, 239.8. I don't appreciate y'all right now. Let's look at a few people that said they'd follow Jesus, but they wanted to do it with a partial commitment. Okay, write this down. Go back and read it later. This is Luke chapter nine, verse 57 through 62. Luke chapter nine, verse 57 through 62. And this is what it says. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath nowhere to lay his head. You sure you want to do that? Verse 59, I like this because it says, and he said to another, follow me. See, the first guy said, Jesus, I'll follow you. Jesus said, you sure about that? Look, I ain't got nowhere to lay my head, man. You follow me. It's a it's a commitment. But he turns to the next dude. and He goes, hey, you follow me. The first guy says, I'll follow you. The second guy, Jesus says, you follow me. Listen to what happened. He says, He says unto him, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. You guys have heard this story before because it's been preached plenty of times because we've learned this from and from the the lens of commitment. I want to follow the Lord, but let me do all these other things first. Okay, verse 60, Jesus said unto him, let the bed bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord, I do want to follow you, but can I do this, this and this first? I mean, I want to be committed, but I mean, I'm I'm like pulled in a couple directions here, Lord. Here's the question I'd like for all of us to internalize. What might my life look like if I totally committed to God? That's what I want you to ask you. Don't look around the room and ask the person beside you. Ask you, what might my life look like if I totally committed to God? Matthew 22 and 37 says this, Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. That is what you call total commitment. Everything you got, you give that to God. You love God with every ounce of who you are. That's total commitment. What we've done is we've thought we've had total commitment because I have church attendance, because I give an offering. I do a few things that are good things. Don't get me wrong. But we've never learned to totally commit to him. 
In John chapter 6, you can read this, but in John chapter 6, Jesus is teaching and he's explaining to them that if you follow me, you're going to have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. He's, he's explaining to them that, that they have to buy into him and to, to consume him and to take in who he is. And people start murmuring. They don't understand. What is he talking about? I don't get it. Who, who, this is too hard to deal with. And they started to leave. He started challenging them and they started to leave. It wasn't a smooth, easy sermon. So they started to leave. And if you look at verse 66 through 69, Jesus gets to a point where he looks and he sees them leaving and he turns and he looks at his guys, his 12. And he says, are y'all going to leave me, too? That's what he asked them. He's watching these people leave. Oh, you go, oh, he's gone. She, she finna go, sister, you go. Oh. Fellas, y'all going to leave me, too? Verse 66 says, at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. I like that. Deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you also going to leave? Then Peter, with his mouth, opens it. You know, Peter, the big mouth. Peter, Simon, Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? Where are we going to go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know you are the Holy One of God. Where would we go and get what we got with you? This is Peter saying we are committed to this, Jesus. Now, if you know anything about Peter, that was just words. Because not long after this, he's going to deny Jesus three times before the rooster even crows. But not long after that, he renews his commitment to a point where he starts to preach. And they told him, Peter, you better shut up or we're going to kill you. Peter says, I can't listen to you. And they beat him to an inch of his life. And you know what he did after he got up from that whooping? He went back and preached again. So he went from being the dude that was saying, I don't know who this dude is, to the one that says, you could never get me to, to deny him again. His commitment was renewed. How did that happen? It's when he finally understood who Jesus was. See, he says it right here that he understands, but he really didn't understand until Jesus met him on that shore. And he says, do you love me? He thought he knew. Je he watched Jesus feed 5000 people. He saw Jesus spit in dirt and dirt and, and heal a blind man. He saw all these wonderful things. And he, he even spoke from his mouth. You are the son of God. But until he really got what he was saying. His commitment was wavering. And I think we do the same thing. We say a lot of the church stuff. We good at that. Hallelujah. Amen. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Won't he do it? We got all these church sayings. But at the end of the day. Did I send you all that picture that says just because I you can't tell me that I need to come to church just because I Moses killed Goliath. Did I send you all that? Did I send y'all that? I thought it was so funny. But we have so many people that have a surface relationship with God. They have no depth. Some people read that. What's the big deal? I don't get it. Moses killed Goliath. So what? Moses killed a lot of people. Moses didn't kill Goliath. David did. But you don't know that because you never spend time in the Word. And the devil knows it. But this is where our commitments gain momentum. When we like Peter, we believe God's word and we know that he is the promised Messiah. Because when those two things come together, your belief and you truly understanding who Jesus is, your commitment ramps up. Because now you know what you're committed to. Something else you said years ago. You said many men will live for a lie, but no one will die for one. Do you get what that means? See, my commitment, I'm committed to a lie, even though I can know it's a lie. I can still, I'm watching the January 6th hearings, y'all. I, I ain't watching none of it. I just happened to turn it on one day and I'm watching for 15 minutes. And I'm like, how could they still support wrong when this is so evident? I'm so committed to what I want to be committed to. Who cares if it's wrong? 
But when it's brought to you and you see truth, now you got to squirm in your flesh a little bit. Now you got to make a tough decision. I mean, I know God didn't reveal to me that this is wrong now. Yeah, but I like doing the wrong. But now you got to make a choice. Now your commitment comes into question, because if you truly believe in the word of God, then anything contrary to the word gets no say in your life. If you truly know that Jesus is the Messiah, what he says has to go in your life. It changes your commitment. Now we, would y'all say that Peter wanted Jesus in his life? Yes? No? None of you know? Wake up. Would you say that Peter wanted Jesus in his life? Okay, okay. Would you say that Peter recognized the importance of following Jesus? Okay, okay. So what that tells me is this. We know what we want to see in our lives, but we struggle to commit ourselves to seeing it happen. Show of hands, how many of you want to walk close with Christ? Look around the room real quick. Okay, every hand is up. Not a single hand is down. Everyone wants to walk close with Christ. What will that require of you? It's going to require that you read your Bible. It's going to require that you pray, that you worship him. Now let's do a check of our commitments. This is a self-assessment. This is, don't look at nobody else now. Look within you. And this is not designed to shame you. This is not designed to make you feel guilty. This is my desire in asking you these next three questions is to get us to see how much more we could give to God. How much more could I commit to him? Question number one, how often do you read your Bible? See, I think you were saying that earlier. I say, sister, please don't take all my good stuff. She was like, hey, how often? When's the last? No, she said, when's the last time? Y'all remember that? It was only a few minutes ago. I got it on tape. How often do you read your Bible? Is today the only time your Bible's been open this week? Again, I'm not shaming you. I just want you to think about it. Hmm, you know what? I need to commit myself more in this area. When was the last time you spent quality time in prayer? I'm not talking about blessing your food, Lord, thank you. Rubber dub dub, thank for the grub, amen. Not that. I'm talking about when you were praying so long you lost track of time. I'm talking about when you prayed so long you ran out of words and you were like Hannah just mumbling and just God accept whatever I'm mumbling because I don't even know what else to say. How easily is it for you to miss worship with your brothers and sisters? Like when you wake up on Sunday, do you, is it easy for you to say, I'm not going today? Or if you miss, do you feel like your whole life is off course? If I'm on vacation and I miss church, I feel lacking. I feel gross. I feel like something's missing in my life. I need to get back to church. I want to go to church. And this is what I realized. I've gone to church away from my church, and I just like my church better. You heard it on YouTube land. I like my church better. <laughs> I've been to other churches. And yeah, they may have a bigger choir. And yeah, they may have a lot of more preachers on the pulpit. But I didn't feel God speak to me. I didn't feel his presence, even though I'm this huge church. But when I come back to you guys and I hear my pastor speak and I hear the minister speak on this staff and I, I feel him. I know I'm where I'm supposed to be. I think we may not honor what we have because we haven't seen what else is out there. It ain't all that. My commitment to CCN is great because I recognize how great CCN is. Does that make sense? 
Knowing what is needed means nothing if we will not commit to doing what is needed. Let me say that again in case it went over your head. Knowing what is needed means nothing if we will not do what is needed. A few years ago, my wife, she would nudge me when I was asleep to tell me to roll over because I was snoring. I'm just telling y'all all my bad business, ain't I? That's what you do with family. She said, it sounds like you stop breathing when you're asleep. It scares me. You know, because I am, you know, her, her boo thing. So I went to the doctor and I had a sleep study done. And I had to spend the night away from my wife. It was torture. Hate it when she's not around. They put this thing on me, this mask, and I slept through the night with the mask and all these things all over me and it was reading my signs and they said, every minute you stop breathing nine times every minute. Nine times. Now, that's not a whole bunch from what I found out. There's some people, they, I don't think they breathe at all for a minute. They are blessed to still be on this earth, but not every, every minute, at least nine times per minute, I stop breathing which is why I wake up tired, which is not good for your heart. So they gave me a CPAP machine. Now, get this. I understand that the CPAP is important. And I know that this machine keeps me alive. So why is it that I struggle to wear it every single night? Why is it that I'll wear it one night and take three nights off, knowing that this machine is actually what keeps me alive? Now, how does that pertain to our spiritual life? It's the same thing. We know that our connection to Christ is what keeps us alive. Our connection to Christ gives us, gives our life meaning and purpose and drive. So why will I only commit to walking with him one day a week. Why is Sunday the only day that I'm walking with him and I'm partially walking then? Hmm. You want to hear something beautiful? I'm not telling you until you say yes. Okay, that, that's all you got to do. And don't holler at me. I heard that in the back. You might want to write this down. Commitment to Christ impacts all other commitments. Your commitment to Christ will impact all other commitments. If we ever get this one commitment established, it will permeate our lives and affect every other part of you. Commitment will change your language from I should to I must. You won't say, you know what, I should go to work. I should go to church. I must go to church. I, sh I should give an offering this week. Mm, I must give my tithe and an offering. I should pray a little bit more. I must pray more often. You know what? I should read my Bible. I must read until God speaks to me. In Luke chapter 2, you can go and read this later too. Jesus comes of age. He's, you know, a young boy. And they travel to Jerusalem and, they, you know, they come to Jerusalem once a year for all their festivities and stuff. And they're going back home to, uh, to Nazareth and they get about two, two days down the road and realize Jesus ain't with them. They thought he was riding with the cousin. Jesus ain't in y'all car. No, he ain't in my car. I thought he's riding with you. Oh, Lord, Jesus, we left Jesus. Joseph, turn around. You know, it was Joseph's fault, right? It's always the man's fault. Joseph, turn around. So now they got to go two days back to Jerusalem. Now imagine Mary's heartbeat. Those two, she's nervous. My baby, my baby. God gave me one job and I didn't blew it. I'm supposed to take care of one baby, just one baby. She gets back to the city and guess what? She finds Jesus in the temple talking to all the, the old heads and they are astonished at how wise Jesus is. And she runs over to Jesus and she grabs his arms. This ain't in the Bible, this is what I imagine. She grabs his arms and says, Jesus, how could you do this? You know mama was worried sick. And he said, mama, what you worried about? Why were you looking for me? You know I must be about my father's business. Must, I must. 
It wasn't I should do my father's business. I must be about my father's business. His commitment was to doing what God had called him to do. His first, second, and third priorities was to please his father. What if our first, second, and third priorities was to do what pleased God? What if we developed an I must mindset? Paul once wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, 7 and 8, that he wished that everybody was single like him. Not that being married is a bad thing. Marriage, the Bible says that he that finds a wife finds a good thing. Marriage is a great thing. But what Paul was saying was, when you're married, you have a divided commitment. I got to deal with what God wants me to deal with, and I got to take care of my family. I'm divided. And since I'm divided, I can't be 100 percent. So I wish that everybody was like me and just, you know what, don't even worry about that part of the life. Just hang out with Jesus. But if you can't control yourself, <laughs> go on and get married because it's better to marry than to burn. That's what he said. Commitment to Christ impacts all other commitments. Here's another one. Keeping commitments always costs you something. Keeping your commitments always costs you something. I quit coaching basketball when Columbus was born. He's 12 years old now. And when, when I decided to resign, my wife said she thought I would change my mind until the moment I made it official. Because she knew how much I liked basketball. I really liked coaching basketball. But the moment I held my son in my arms, I recognized I wasn't going to be able to be committed to both of them 100%. I like basketball. I love my family. I like basketball. I love my family. That was an easy choice to make. So I resigned from coaching basketball so I can be a great father. Now, many people can balance these two. I watch men do it every day. But I wasn't interested in balancing the two. I wanted to excel. I wanted to win every game. And I wanted to be a great father. And I couldn't do them both. So one of them had to go. Commitment will always cost you something. When you commit your way to God, don't be surprised if it costs you some of your friends. They won't want to hang with you anymore because your mindset is always this God stuff. God, 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 God. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of us are too gotty, gotty. And what I mean by that is, come on now. We trying to eat dinner. You, you know, I bet Jesus had a biscuit like this. Really? Really? Jesus like, man, don't bring me up in y'all conversation no more. Just eat. But please don't ever feel like you have to restrict Jesus in you. Let him out. Just don't be the spooky Christian. I mean, that's, you know, my door don't open. Ooh, there you go. Jesus knows what I need. No, you need a battery. It has nothing to do with the Holy Ghost making that key fob work. I, watch, I listen to coaches' wives say all the time. I listen to the tone of their voice during basketball season. And you can tell that during basketball season, their husband's commitment to home was wavery. And I was like, you know what? I can't do that to my wife. I have to be a great father. So I said, I'm done with basketball. Now, 12 years has passed. I got people who ask me all the time, you miss it? You wish you were still coaching? No, I don't. I like getting home at a decent hour. I don't like driving other kids around town everywhere I go. I got my own kids. They get on my nerves enough. I ain't got time for nobody else's kids getting on my nerves. So commitment will cost you every single time. Matthew 19 and 29 says this, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit eternal life. This is what Jesus says. If you will commit to me over everything, no one has ever done this that I haven't given you 100%. 
and given you eternal life. Being committed to Christ is going to cost you something, but the reward of choosing Christ is greater than the cost of following him. The last one, commitment is kept through consistency. Commitment is kept through consistency. I was consistent for three months and I saw great results. And then I allowed my commitment to waver. And every day I wake up going, why did you have to eat that ham? And I know what I need to do. And I know what it's gonna take to start over, but it's hard. I, I really wanna start like yesterday, but it's hard. So then the question comes in, how bad do you really want this? Because if you really, 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 really want it, you will make it happen. You will commit to it again. And this time, because you've experienced going back, you won't let that happen to you again. I think Columbus read this scripture the other day, James chapter one, verse one through eight. And um, I'm going to read to you verse three through verse eight. And it says this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave on the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Here it is. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I just told you commitment is kept through consistency. A double minded man is an uncommitted man. A man that is not singularly focused. He's dual. He's triple. He's his mind is everywhere. He's he's pulled by every new thing, every cool thing, every everything except being tunnel vision on the things of God. When Mary came to Jesus, his statement was, Mom, I must be about my father's business. What if that was our statement? I must be about my father's business. I'm tunnel vision, single vision. I see nothing but one goal, one task. The first point I share with you is that commitment to Christ impacts all commitments. And according to James, being uncommitted to Christ impacts our stability in life. Notice what's impacted. He says that a man that is double minded an uncommitted man is shaky in all his ways. All right. There's no stability when you're uncommitted. That's right. When we aren't truly committed to Christ. We will see that we will have commitment issues in all other parts of our life. Galatians 5 and 16 says this, I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the spirit is a lifestyle of consistent reliance on God for guidance, for direction. And what happens when you walk with him this way? What happens when you walk intently and focused on being the man, the woman he wants you to be? The flesh no longer wins. And once you get committed to something and you're truly committed to it, keeping your commitment becomes easier and easier and easier and easier. It's only hard when we are on again, off again, on again, off again. The blessing is that Jesus tells us to just start where you are. You want to get back on track, Brother Cody, just start where you are. Today's the perfect day to start eating better today. Today's a great day to go walk today. But I can't walk as far as I used to walk. It's okay. Walk what you can walk and eat a little bit better today. And then tomorrow, if I give you a tomorrow, Brother Cody, I want you to improve on what you did yesterday. And before you know it, you will have created habits in your life that you will be able to keep because you recognize now it's not about this tiny goal. The big goal is I want to change my life. So remember this, our commitment to Christ will impact all other commitments in our lives. If we allow him to reign in our life, 
we will watch how the rest of our life will line up perfectly. Remember this, keeping our commitments will always cost us something. But the reward is worth the cost. Remember this, our commitments are kept through consistency. Push through the pain, push past the mundane. I heard this already, I'm tired of this already. Push past that. It's, it's, it's what I do every single day, push past that. I remember one day I woke up and I immediately started praying and I thought to myself, Lord, I wonder do you even accept this anymore? I feel like I'm a robot. Like as if it's just, it wasn't even me anymore. I woke up and I was like, Lord, thank you so much for waking me up and giving me enough. And the Lord was like, uh, no, that's where I wanted you to be. Why would I not accept that? Because it's, it is sincere. Now, if it was, wasn't sincere, then no, I wouldn't accept that. But you woke up and your first thought was me. Oh, no, I accept that. Be single minded in your walk with Christ. Let me share this with you and I'm gone. Commitment woke Jesus up every single day to train 12 guys that would eventually change this whole world. Commitment woke him up and did that. Commitment gave Jesus the strength to heave that cross up that hill one step at a time. Commitment did that. Commitment saw Jesus through the pain of abandonment, saw Jesus through the pain of the insults, the spit, the thorns in his head, the, 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 the nails in his palms and his feet, and the spear in his side. Commitment got him through all of that. Commitment is the reason that you and I can be saved. His commitment is the reason why you can go back to the Father. So I beg you. Paul would say, I beseech you, I beg you, brothers and sisters, today, if you are not committed to him, give him your heart today. And if you have committed but you know you've kind of done like Brother Cody on the eating and I have kind of abandoned my commitment. Renew your commitment today. Because tomorrow is not promised. And you might be like me. Your tomorrow might come two years from now. Who wants to wait for that? Commit to walk with him daily. And if we do this, we will overcome all of our commitment issues. God bless you, wonderful people. I'm done. Yana, rest my case.